So, Ray, you've been in the NFE space for quite a while. Can you maybe share with us some of the, the, the observations you've seen at this year's show and in the industry as a whole for the past 12 months? Yeah, no, it's interesting. It's actually pretty exciting to see what's going on. I mean, if we look at where we were last year, right, we were talking about all these PLCs and tests and measurements, things going on and baselining. And it's interesting what we're seeing this year is actually real deployments which is kind of nice to see because you see the value of it now. What a lot of carriers are doing in a lot of cases is identifying these low-hanging fruits. So we're seeing things related to like virtual CPE, real deployments for that for managed service, uh, virtual uh, EPC type deployments as well because the value propositions when it looks to the carrier services, those are the ones that um, these carriers are actually deploying lately. So these use cases are becoming real compared to last year where it was a lot of PowerPoints, you know what I mean? Now they're seeing some value. Could you give us, Ray, an example of a, of a use case and, and maybe amplify the, the pain point that's caused and the carriers to really open up their wallets? Sure, yeah, it's a good question, yeah. So I, let's say, for instance, managed service. Let's just use that as an example, right? It's a, it's a big business, IPVPNs, and, uh, and, and it's been profitable for some time, but over the years, it's become somewhat commoditized, and the profit margins in that business is starting to go down. Because if I wanted to change, if I wanted to give you load balancing, you a certain level of security, I would have to do a truck row. Right, so it was very inefficient for the carriers. So there were some carriers in a situation thinking of shutting down that service mm -hmm. uh, or selling it off. And I would tell them to say, your customer acquisition cost is so high, maintain that customer base. Let's see if we could re-architect the network to allow us to re-architect the business, mm -hmm. right? So what you see in this particular case, now the speed to innovation, you could be centralized or kind of hybrid approach, and they're regaining their profit margins, but what they're finding out is they're able to add services quicker with that as well. So they, they're able to gain uh, some profitability because they reduce the cost, but also be able to get some new revenue opportunities because they could expand into markets where they couldn't, whether it's SMB and other spaces as well. Well, Hassan, it's been a year since we last met. We met here at Mobile World Congress. Uh, what kind of conversations are you having with your customers or prospective customers that you, you perhaps weren't having last year? Um, yeah, you know, one of, one of the big uh, differences that we started to see about a year ago is that um, uh, NFE and the way that people think about how to build their networks has really moved out of the evangelism phase. We've, uh, you know, prior to that, we used to evangelize a fair bit about uh, the technology. We really haven't done any of that. It's um, it's moved very much into a mainstream um, part of every every operator's thinking. So, uh, what we how that gets reflected for us, our customer base, deployed customers, has grown uh, quite a bit over the last year. We're 35 or so commercial deployments. And uh, interestingly enough, we've got probably another 50 or so trials underway. So it's uh, it's remarkable in the in, in a year how much activity has grown. We're seeing, um, uh, I mean, we have um, I want to say 20 or so networks up and running with very large numbers of subscribers. So I think uh, this is becoming very very real, and I think that's the really big difference we've seen in the last 12 months. Yeah, and you've had traction recently with Cubic, Vodafone, I think AT and T, and another year. Um, uh, uh, Saudi uh, carrier, what uh, maybe you could give some insight as to what was the catalyst, uh, what provoked them to really start implementation this year versus waiting another year? Um, you know, I think it varies depending on uh, on the operator, but um, a big factor in all of this is you've actually got at the we're at a stage, a tipping point in the market where the um, virtualized implementations that we provide are actually every bit as good, if not better, than what you could do with the legacy. So now, if you know that the legacy is something you're eventually going to be throwing away, uh, the notion of spending more money on that is yeah, just, a, just a bad idea. So when, when you're in a situation where the new technology is outperforming the old, which is where we are now um, from a performance standpoint, it just makes much more sense to, to move forward. To, so what we found with um, some of our uh, large tier one operators, the guys who are doing consumer deployment is just a fantastic play for them in terms of um, expanding their networks and being able to um, get their costs under control. In the case of the IoT guys, where a handful of customers you mentioned start with uh, uh, the Internet of Things deployments, there the ARPUs are low enough that uh, the legacy infrastructure just doesn't make sense. Uh, and so it's, it's an enabler. And as I understand, the IoT guys picked your EPC, virtualized EPC, as a service enabler. Can you maybe give us an example of uh, some of the service offerings that uh, you're helping them launch? Sure. Well, the, uh, 
We, we, we see actually uh, quite a variety, but one of, the, one of the themes that's developed around Cubic and Vodafone and, and so forth is automotive. So uh, Cubic, uh, as, you, as you know, has, um, provides a European coverage for Audi. Um, Vodafone has a lot of uh, uh, connected car uh, capability as well. And um, so automotive is a very, very meaningful theme. We see security, uh, video, things like that uh, as additional themes in the whole M to M space. So it's uh, that's an exciting space where I think the number of applications have, uh, you know, we're just really in our infancy. So Ray, traditional equipment providers have made their money for years by selling high dollar equipment solutions, and now they want to be SDN companies and virtualization companies. Are they are they conflicted, and how do they make that transition from a hardware vendor to a software service provider? You know, it's a really valid question and one that we really need to go deep in. So, the, so first of I've all, I've got plenty of time. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I think you have to look at the economics for them, right? So, in a lot of cases, they have a customer install base that they're like, how do I do? I really want to disrupt that. I'm making good margins in a lot of that particular case. So that, so in a lot of cases, they weren't as innovative, right? And if you look at the driver between, let's say, NFE or something like that, it was driven by the industry, not one vendor, right? Now. The mistake that I'm seeing in some cases with some of these solutions you need to be careful with is you see these silo solutions where you got the box and everything integrated and they're like, well, let me just create an NFV component. So you're going from silo to silo and there isn't much to gain in that place, right? You need to think a little bit further in that case is how do I integrate it and look at the service from a whole and disrupt the entire model, right? So you are seeing a lot of them announce things, but silo to silo is not going to get gain much from that point of view. Mm -hmm. They need to look at how do I create the service and reduce the risk of these providers deploying these business, right? Because if you're, let's say, a board level exec at a service provider, right? You're forced to be in risk adverse. We've created that environment, right? Because if I make a mistake on a service, right, it's gonna take me, let's say, 18 months to 24 months to deploy that service and pretty expensive. And it's gonna take me sometimes twice as long to decommission that. So I'm forced to be risk adverse. Right, so when the networking group comes to me and say, hey, we want this, I always have to push back in a lot, in a lot of cases, right? NFV allows them, at least in right direction, right, to say, I need to disrupt this particular model in that case. So, so the vendors that are announcing it need to think a little bit further besides saying, here's a quick reaction of silo to silo, it isn't gonna gain much. It's how do I get to the point where I reduce the risk of deploying services and deploying them quicker and more efficiently? Uh, and making it more profitable too. Because mm -hmm. in a lot of cases, these ARPUs are flat. So they have to figure out is how to create, let's say instead of an ARPU, how to create what I call an APU, average profit per user. How do I increase my average profit per user? And I think that's what's going on in that particular space. Long-winded answer, but Yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah. So Hassan, yeah. you're a disruptor, right? So you're, a, uh, I talked about equipment providers trying to be software providers. Are you a software provider that's disrupting the hardware guys? And if so, talk about your, your business model and how you, when you get a win, what does that business model look like? Yeah. Uh, so there's no doubt we're a software company, and uh, uh, Ray hit on a really important point, uh, which is really central to why we even started a firm. And it, uh, you know, if you sort of think about uh, legacy networks, one of the biggest problems in those networks is the rate at which you can innovate, because it's such a difficult task to put up a new service, um, and the notion of virtualization, where you just you know, virtualize the individual components, uh, so you get the same crappy network you started with when it, when it comes to flexibility, right? <laughs> Pardon the terminology. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, uh, so, so what we've done is not just turn things to software, but what we've done is uh, taken the entire path from the eNodeB out to the internet, collapse that, and then put a service automation capability on top of it, and that allows you to do things that used to take months, in, in hours or days, and, and so, and that, that, and quite honestly, it it certainly lowers the operator's opex in terms of managing services that they offer today. But the real value, in my opinion, is in uh, sort of uh, energizing the creative juices in terms of new services that you can now do, so you can participate as an operator in the internet economy. And that's what we think is important. Uh, and for that, we just think there's a new paradigm for networking. It's a software-based paradigm, mm -hmm. but it's really one of service flexibility. Now, do you offer your service as a cloud-based service that has a monthly recurring revenues uh, a component to it, or is it more of a software solution that's sold as a one-time sale with maybe escalators over time as the product is adopted by the end user? 
yes and yes. Yes and yes. One of the one of the things, of course, about uh, the, su such a major change in network is that the business models also start to change. Um, we, um, uh, you know, most of our customers like to build and own their networks, so uh, uh, they're large operators, and so we. Um, we, we have um, arrangements with uh, our customers that vary from sort of a traditional CapEx-like model to um, something that's uh, effectively a flat rate uh, on an annual basis mm -hmm. type model. And it really, um, uh, based on, uh, on the operator and the, and the service being, uh, being launched, there are different models that, uh, that work, work well for both of mm -hmm. us. So we talked about the, uh, last year was evangelism, people talking about it. This yeah. year they're opening up their wallets. You're starting to see some success with some implementations. What are you seeing as some of the uh, initial challenges or unexpected challenges of deploying a virtualized solution? And then how's the community overcoming some of those um, challenges? Yeah, there's a combination of a few things. Uh, the first one is some of the skill sets that's required, mm -hmm. right? And also the organizational challenge. Right, so in a lot of cases, let's say in the um, networking group, let's say it was a managed service example again, the networking group managed everything to the CPE device, to the core, right? Uh, in some of these deployments, now these things become a cloud function that's mm -hmm. running in an IT. So who owns the SLA, right? Is it the networking group? Is it the IT group, right? So you are seeing certain service providers combine those groups like what at and is doing and others. And so that's the first part of the challenge because otherwise there's some people that are going to stop innovation because saying I'm losing responsibility on my network and I don't trust that particular IT group or vice versa and stuff. So I think the organization, then the skill set, right? You're, you're seeing a lot of, um, uh, of these traditional people that are used to touching a CLI or something to that effect saying, what do you mean I can do this and write a Python script and all that particular piece? Mm -hmm. and, and then the third piece is the mindset, right? Which I think you kind of talked about is that whether it's IoT or something like that, I see a lot of talk in this show. And if the carriers think of, let's say, IoT deployment for purely connectivity, Unless they've got ridiculous amount of scale, they're going to make money, but they have to think further to say is, I need to bring a level of automation, uh, some type of managed service, and, and optimize that network. And that's how I regain the mm -hmm. particular revenue. Mm -hmm. I think that's where we are today there. That's a great question about yeah. the skill set. Um, yeah. Last month, Randall Stevenson from AT&T basically said to his employees, learn the cloud or else. Or else. Yeah. So when you built your model, did you anticipate offering professional services to help that skill gap between IT and ops? And if so, what type of professional services are you offering today to help close this gap? Yeah, uh, well, first of all, from a product perspective, um, we, uh, we're really bringing a, not just a different paradigm for how you build the network, but also how you manage it and monetize it. And we knew that uh, that potentially could be a big step for to do all of that stuff simultaneously. So what we did in our system is we allow um, a sort of more of a legacy operations model on the new network architecture and then a brand new operations model that provides all the service automation. Um, Skill set is probably the single biggest issue, uh, and you know, as you as you mentioned, Randall's all over that at 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 and T. They've been moving quite aggressively. Um, the um, w what we um, uh, provide and uh, what's worked out well in these uh, early deployments is we provide a um, professional services managed service capability, mm -hmm. and um, it, it's terrific. You know, we've we've been in situations where customers just asked us to bring up the production network and run it for a little while. And then you have um, affirmed um, expertise on site um, for a handful of months where it really becomes like on site training um, where we're helping you run the network. And, and I think uh, uh, it's something that people embrace quite quickly because the, the paradigm is just so easy. Yeah. Well, both of you mentioned the word skill set, and you mentioned writing a Python script. Can you maybe expand upon? the specific skill sets that are required to launch successfully these type of solutions? Yeah, I, I would start. I, I think um, you could take a step back also is also the processes too need to be enhanced because um, uh, if you keep the same old processes, you know, sometime you could slow down the innovation, right? So I think initially the, the skill set is to go from this mindset of thinking of per box solution to a service thing. So that when you program a service, right? Let's say I'm programming an IPTV service, right? Um, I, I normally need, let's say, a router, two switches, two firewalls, and a billing system. You always have to have a billing system for the service provider, right? If I misconfigure one box, I can get in trouble because later on I don't know if the service works. 
when you look at a service across the board, like you can program the service, right? Mm -hmm. If one box fails, the entire service fails. That saves me from a disaster point of view, right? So I think being able to get a high level where you're programming a service as opposed to the individual components is that kind of set, right? Mm -hmm. So whether it's a Python script or something else from that point of view, they need to move up from a layer of saying, I need to stop thinking about devices and think about services. Mm -hmm. So the net net is that yeah. programmer skills and process skill? Well, you, you need to know the ideas of networking first, right? Mm -hmm. uh, from that point of view. So you do need to have a level of saying from a program point of view, how do I make and create automation capabilities? So yeah. things that I used to do manually, how could I program something to automate these different functions? And if I can't do it, I find some companies that have already done it. And then after you do the automation is to create a level of optimization in that piece. So yeah, taking the engineering level to programming the, the intelligence in the network. Yeah. And Hassan, maybe talk about the skill set as you get into these implementations. What are the skill sets that are particularly key to a successful implementation? Um, I think um, one of the things that you find in networks today, particularly on the operation side, is you have experts on each box that makes up the chain. And so, in, a, uh, in a traditional legacy. Right, yeah. Yeah. And so my, uh, my knowledge uh, uh, might be very limited to a, a box or two that forms the chain. And as Ray pointed out, the service isn't done by one box. It's, it's, the service is distributed across this chain of, of platforms. So the biggest um, uh, skill set change that we find is exactly the notion of being able to think at a service level as opposed to I'm an expert in the PCRF. Or, and and so you you um, as a, in the great I'm thing I'm thinking about of a sandbox. How do you get these <laughs> yeah, guys to play? Yeah, I got my right. sandbox over here. Well, How do you is, get people to play well is, together? Exactly, and this is the great thing about um, about the software world, is that uh, when you think about service layer abstractions, you think about things at a service level. The software tools are, uh, have gotten to the point where you can really build very easy service creation environments. So in our case, for example. Yeah, when you create a service, you can literally just drag and drop the functions that you need to create a service, and then you can uh, configure the capabilities, nice. and um, and that uh, and that gets automatically um, sanity checked for any inconsistencies, and then loaded onto the network. You can do this in minutes, and uh, that's a huge difference in terms of efficiency and how you even build a service and how quickly you can create one. The time, of course, uh, the, the skill set, of course, is being able to think at that level. Right. And b by the way, when you think about it, that's really much more natural for an operator. I mean, operators have been used to, operators provide services to their customers, but they're used to breaking them down into th rules that you program into boxes. It, so what we're doing is raising yeah. the abstraction layer to something that an operator should be thinking about, which is how do I make a service? Yeah. Okay. So Ray, let's, let's maybe talk about the ecosystem required for a successful implementation. Yeah. Uh, who, who are, what are the building blocks for, for the ecosystem, NFE, SDN ecosystem? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question because like we talked about across the service, right, and, and what has to happen is it's difficult sometimes for one vendor to be able to do it all, right, from that point of view. So being able to pick best of breed uh, in that situation and having the flexibility, right, to be able to pull and rip and replace stuff we, helps them reduce that risk that we talked about for the carrier, right? Mm -hmm. So ecosystem is going to be vital for this. Openness is going to be extremely vital from this. If you get into this area where you create a proprietary layer of software across the board, five years from now we're going to be looking at saying what were we thinking? Yeah. What could be worse off yeah. in that situation? So the ecosystem is going to be extremely vital with the capability to have openness to go across the board. Okay. I, I think NFE needs that to be successful. Well, I've been walking around the floor here at Mobile World Congress, and I see a firm in a lot of different booths. Talk about your ecosystem and, and some of the partners that uh, you're working with this year. Um, thanks. I'm glad you. Thanks for noticing. <laughs> we're, we're in uh, five or six different partner booths uh, this time around, and um, it's reflective, I, th I think, of of, of this tran transition that's happening in networking. Um, I, you know, we're moving to an IT-centric network architecture as opposed to what, what was uh, the legacy model. And uh, we just think that there's a set of players in that world that have a lot to contribute that historically have been on the IT side of operators but not so much on the network side. So for example, we have partners in, in um, uh, EMC, VMware, um, uh, Juniper, and uh, uh, HP, and so forth. And, and what that um, really does is it brings a lot of the IT expertise, the ability to create 
um, integration services, the ability to create um, complete uh, IT systems, and that really IT thinking into the equation. Um, these are um, partners that we think do a terrific job. Uh, we um, were able to fill out, if you will, a complete network deployment uh, set of portfolio of products, and you can see that it uh, that our op our partners range from traditional IT suppliers to the likes of uh, traditional hardware suppliers who are just innovative on the software. Juniper being an example of yeah. that, which we just announced recently. So uh, I think this uh, this is an ecosystem in which we're all working together and uh, and able to uh, really change the paradigm. There's so much of the network. Uh, all the pieces have to be able to move to this new architecture. Well, let, let's talk about a term that uh, we haven't talked about. You haven't heard a lot of people talk about it, but when you're dealing with a, a multi-vendor ecosystem and you're dealing with a multi-box virtualized solution, no one's talking about the service level agreement and who's going to be held accountable and how do you, it's real time. So maybe talk a little bit about, do you offer some sort of service level agreement to a real time end to end because you're going from the cloud? Yeah, this is an area that's evolving very quickly. Um, in some of our early deployments, uh, which go back a couple of years, we actually took on uh, the entire um, uh, responsibility and service level agreement. So we, we provided, we even resold the underlying uh, server hardware because it allowed for the one throat to choke model um, in, in those early deployments. I think the industry's come a long way since those early deployments. And uh, what's happened is that um, uh, operators have gotten quite good at building their NFB infrastructure, their, their private cloud mm -hmm. model in the data center. And operators, in fact, um, you know, really do take on um, the, the assurance of, of that capability. And, but then when you step up to the application level, we own the service level agreement. And that differentiation or that uh, separation, if you will, between the underlying cloud infrastructure and, uh, and the application has, has become, um, or is increasingly becoming, actually a pretty well-structured uh, system where uh, you can separate the two and you can actually think about individual service level agreements. Okay, well let's, uh, uh, Ray, why don't you pick up on the SLA as it relates to say a, a, a virtual CP. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now it's a carrier that's turned around and offering enterprise uh, a virtual C CPs based on a virtualized solution. What do you see the carriers doing in terms of offering SLAs associated with that end user product? Well, I think the first part is because they, they can centralize or have a hybrid approach is they have a flexibility uh, on how they want to offer the SLA mm -hmm. point of view, whether they could use either an integration partner, they could choose to develop the skill sets to manage themselves and yeah. even gain some profitability on top of that if they want to own that, where before they didn't have that. Because it's new managed service. Exactly, it's the yeah. new managed service. Okay. So, so it gives them different revenue opportunities and multiple choices from that point of view, as opposed to saying I could only go in this direction and that's it. So uh, depending on, in some cases, some enterprises might say, I trust this integrator. They've been helping me build a network. Could they take over this particular cloud yeah. piece? So you're seeing some of that as well. There. Okay, yeah. well let's wrap up on 5G. That's the other big topic here. So uh, the investment carriers are making Hassan in, in your solution, for example. How does it fit into a longer term 5G strategy? I think um, uh, we're kind of proud of this. We think uh, that we stand out uh, somewhat differently than everybody else in this regard because uh, to raise earlier point, um, there's, um, uh, you know, as people scramble to catch up, what they're doing is sort of lifting and shifting the old stuff, right? So they're taking, uh, and, and one of the big ch problems with that is the old stuff is very monolithic, whereas 5G architectures in the core really demand, um, in some ways, highly decomposed architectures. Uh, Affirm had the benefit when we started of being on a clean sheet of paper, so we actually built a solution that was natively decomposed, and so um, the, things that we're putting in place today naturally fit into what the best thinking is today around 5G architectures. And I think that's actually pretty critical. And what we're doing today, where we're combining various traffic types on a common network, is uh, a practice run for what it's going to look like with 5G with, with a thousand times the volume. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Any closing comments, Ray? Yeah, no, I would say uh, to me, honestly, this is all exciting, you know, whether it's 5G and, and this innovation. It's good to see literally from going from the proof of concept to actually reality. So what I'm going to be tracking is EBITDA. Is the needle moving to the left or moving to the right lately from that point of view? And if it's moving positively, then we know we're getting in the right direction yeah, good. there. Good. So bottom line results. Yeah, bottom Gentlemen, line thanks results. for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate it.